Good morning, guys. How are y'all doing today? Uh, it is um, Monday, August 15th, and this is 9 a.m., and we are at the Flagler County Board of County Commissioners Workshop, and uh, I'm Commissioner Joe Mullins. I want to welcome everybody, and we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, Ken, if you will, you, you've served in the Army, our military. I love having the military people. We, we do love having them start the pledge, if you'd give us the honor. And this is uh, Commissioner Ken Bryan from, uh, our Chairman Ken Bryan from Flagler Beach. To the, to the flag of the United States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Appreciate you doing that. Um, and now if we can have a moment of silence and prayer, uh, we ask God to bless all the citizens of Flagler County especially all our men and women in the military around the world standing the watch to maintain our freedom. Here at home, our brave first responders, including police, firemen, and emergency medical personnel that keep us safe and away from danger and secure in our homes. Also like to continue to keep the people in the Ukraine in our prayer and also add people that are suffering, uh, this is very near and dear to me, from addiction, um, from uh, mental health and addiction which we are taking very serious in this community. Um, if we all have a moment of silence and prayer. All right. And uh, again, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm the Flagler County Board Chair, and then we'll, we'll go ahead now to item four. It's our beach and dune management discussion and presentation. Good morning, Faith al Khatib, County Engineer. Um, we are here today to discuss the Beach Management Study Final Report. I have with us Chris and Ben from Olson Associate, uh, but also I would like to acknowledge Jason from the Corp of Engineers. He's here. He's the project manager <coughs> for our one of our Dunes project. Also, Ron Mead and Paul from FGT to answer any of your questions about any of the issues related to our dunes and beaches erosion. As you know, Flagler County beaches and dunes are critically eroding and have been for many years. A few years ago, 18 miles of county beaches and dunes were severely impacted by Hurricane Matthew. Uh, Dorian and Irma. As a result of these storms, 11.4 miles of the dunes were restored at that time. As you know, we are still working on another three different projects. We are working with the Corp of Engineers, working with FDOT, DEP, and also FEMA. At this time, we have three projects in the work. Two of them within the city of Lager Beach limit, the Corp Engineer Project and DOT Project. These two projects have been designed and permitted for almost two years ago. And the only outstanding issues related to it, getting the easement so we can move on to the construction phase. We know we have some funding allocated, total grant funding, but at this time with a ongoing erosion, that quantity might be increased. And that means the cost of this project should be increased at this time. When we get closer to start the construction phase, we will do much more survey and acknowledge the exact quantities we lost through uh, recent erosion issues. On November 2019, at a workshop, you, the board, instructed us to go and do a long-term beach management plan study. February 21st, the county contracted with Olson Associate to conduct the study, which would serve as a basis for development and implementation of a long beach management plan. On February 
2022 workshop, Olsen Associates, Chris Creed, he came here and he presented to you their findings, our findings. And also at that workshop, we got your input and the public input about um, our study. With that said, I will turn it over to Chris Creed to go over much more details, information about the final report for the plan. Thank you. Faith, uh, could I just ask of the, <clears throat> when we get, when Chris does his report, are, are you expecting us today to pick one of the six plans in impl to implement? Um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that at this time. After today, workshop will be coming back to you with much more details, a plan, and at that time, you can get your input. But we would love to hear your opinion about each alternative. Right, I would, Chris, I would say that of the six, the first three are just Band-Aid fixes, I think. And then four, five, and six are unaffordable at this time. There's too much money. So anyway, I just want to make sure, don't make us put us on record to try to pick one of these because I think there's still some more stuff that has to come out. I agree with you. It's okay. time for us to to pick a good long, a good solution for our coastline. Yeah, we cannot that, just do yeah. Band-Aid the way how we did after Matthews. I think what Chris did is a good starting point, but we need to... Uh, yeah. uh, we'll talk about that, yeah, yes, Commissioner. Right. If, yeah. if I can say something real quick to my fellow commissioners, um, since this is such a serious topic and it's a big issue that we have, I want to relax if you guys are okay relax the rules here y'all just jump in if you got a question or something and and uh, within within reason just jump in and ask so don't worry about stopping me or or grabbing me just if you want to stop something at some point and ask a question i think that's probably okay. better that we understand along the way if you guys are fine with that yeah. you guys are. Mm -hmm. just uh, i had one mr chairman just one okay, one ahead. last question before we start um just to give us some feeling uh faith how much money has this study cost us? It cost us approximately $250,000, and that's our contract with Olson Associates to do this study. Thanks. Yeah. It, yeah, I'll give a little more detail, too. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to give some background about myself also. But real quick, to answer a couple of the questions, yeah, um, the study was intended to kind of bracket uh, some, some options uh, and frame... I think um, to get an idea of the general scope and magnitude of what you may be faced with when you're asked to look at addressing 18 miles of shoreline. That's a very ambitious, very ambitious project. And so although the costs are very high, these estimated costs, and I'll get into that a little bit, uh, given the scale of this at 18 miles, which is what the study was uh, scoped to address, it's, it's a pretty ambitious program. So. Um, <clears throat> With respect to um, who we are uh, at Olson Associates, Olson Associates was founded by a gentleman named Eric Olson in 1982, and this is our so this is our 40th year in existence of practicing coastal engineering, principally in the state of Florida. <clears throat> I was hired in 1992. I have an undergraduate degree in civil engineering from North Carolina State and a master's in coastal and ocean engineering from the University of Delaware. <clears throat> Actually, my advisor for my my master's program was Eric Olson's classmate at the University of Florida in the late 1960s. He's a gentleman named Tony Dalrymple. Nonetheless, I was hired by Eric in 1992, and this is my 30th year practicing beach management topics in the state of Florida as a professional engineer. I was licensed in 1995, and I'm presently licensed in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and the state of Florida, <coughs> and I've done nothing but this for the past 30 years. And so this experience is that we've <clears throat> encompassed into this beach management study that we've done is based upon my experience as well as the experience of my colleagues at Olson Associates and those of consultants we work with, principally environmental consultants, and their advice on things we should keep in mind as we advise Flagler County in moving forward with this program. I'd like to introduce Ben Gross, a colleague here who was very instrumental <clears throat> in, in putting this together and running around in circles with directions and, and trying to frame up a, a, a report that could be digestible, have the technical base, baseline and information in it to help address some of these questions, but also attempt to be a digestible by decision makers, you, uh, to, to come up with how you may want to lead the community in this program moving forward. 
So I'd like to start with where we are and things that we have done recently. Um, as many of you are aware, <clears throat> Flagler County really did not get into the beach management business until after Hurricane Matthew. Principally, uh, before then, we had the, the revetment, the FDOT revetment that was their project to protect A1A, but there was never a, a noticeable need to be proactive as a, from a countywide perspective in restoring and maintaining the beach and dunes. That, that really became more of an apparent need uh, after Hurricane Matthew and the subsequent storm since then, Irma, Dorian, um, and, and some more recent nor'easters. So the, 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 the focus in the, up in, actually before, <coughs> the, uh, before Matthew was the, the Corps of Engineers project listed there in the yellow box that 2022 USACE project, uh, which is the, the result of the 2014 Federal Feasibility Study. And since Matthew, with some of the available funding, the project scope of that has been expanded to the green areas. And so from a long-term perspective in this portion of the county, what has been identified up until this point is how to restore those reaches of shoreline. The funding is available, the permits are in place, and the county is positioned after a little <clears throat> more administrative work on the easement side to construct these projects. However, beyond that, there is no proactive long-term plan on how to fund future renourishments and maintenance of those projects within that yellow box. Then you expand up into the northern part of the county. <clears throat> now you can see there's a little overlap between the two in the gray box there where it says permitted, not planned for construction. That's a truncated portion of the project where we currently have permits, but we do not plan to place sand there at this point in time because of a funding availability. But we do also have the DOT secret wall that was constructed just a couple of years ago to protect that portion of A1A and the beach and dune. But within the red box, there is no current long-term plan. There are some smaller projects currently being uh, planned by Hammock Dunes to restore uh, the dune. They're all above mean high water. And there is, the FEMA, there is some FEMA funding available from a post-Dorian, from the Dorian event. And we are also helping the county seek a dune restoration permit and not a comprehensive beach and dune restoration permit for areas along the northern part of the county. However, the funding is limited. The funding only addresses these immediate needs and it does not address the long-term plan. So when we were tasked to look at a beach management plan, following typical Corps of Engineers planning approach, you look at a 50-year horizon. And that helps you frame what is the scope of the project and what might the funding requirements be over that 50-year period for the community and all the all their stakeholders, including your cost sharing partners, the Corps of Engineers in the state of Florida. And so this is really where we are. We have a very limited area of Flagler County currently scoped and permitted and funding only available for the initial construction of that. So we're the gap is, is how do we expand the scope of the project to the other parts of the county and pay for it over a long period of time? So the objectives of the study, again, we were, to, we were asked to look at the entire 18 miles of Flagler County that had never been done before and from a comprehensive sense. And look at the, what are the existing conditions of the beach and dune after these storm events and after the events the other small projects that you guys pursued with the available funding after Matthew and Irma. Uh, we want to look at the historical beach and dune change. That, that's important from two perspectives, is where were you in the past? How much did you have in the past? But also, how quickly does it change over time, which helps in the future planning of, uh, for future projects? And then we wanted to develop concepts. These are concepts, again. These are to frame what may be considered as reasonable approaches based upon our experience and other examples uh, of shorelines like Flagler County. Uh, beach restoration and dune restoration and maintenance was our principal focus. Uh, those are what we believe are the most permittable approaches to this. And it's really when you, get, when you look at framing concepts for consideration, you really need to consider what can we get permits for? What would the state of Florida and the federal government allow us to do? And the most reasonable things are initial restoration and maintenance from using uh, sand sources from beyond the coastal system. So identify those sand sources. Where will the sand come from? Estimate the cost about that, and I'll get into each of these as we go through this. And what will Flagler County's responsibility be? And there's lots of, lots of pieces of that that you have to consider when you're looking at implementing a larger comprehensive strategy for your community. 
And then we'll just look at some of the implementation tasks that we have. I'm going to quickly go through this because I know we want to get to questions, and that's really a part of the main part of the thing. Some of the stuff you saw back in February, where we're looking at the typical dune conditions and the average dune heights and volumes, understanding there's quite a bit of difference from north to south in northern part of the county being areas where there's probably a more <laughs> vulnerable uh, section of dune because of a lower dune crust elevation and lower dune volume. Some of this is just the nature of that area of the county. Some of it is storm related. What we really are also interested in is how much sand have you lost over time? And it's interesting to look at this uh, from two time frames, and that's why we picked these two. We picked these two time frames for two reasons. One, there's really the most reliable data in the historical data set in Flagler County. Some of the historical beach data in the county is a little bit sketchy. Does it does not include all the way the entire coastal system from the dune down to the um, down to the depth of closure, well out to about 20, minus 20 feet. But it's interesting to look at 1972, almost 50 years, 72 to 21, and a total volume change. About 3.6 million yards of sand was lost during that period. That included our recent storms, um, and you get an average annual rate of about 73,000 cubic yards per year. But if you look at the more narrow, the more recent change, it shows the real impact that the storms have had. Um, you've almost lost a, almost a third of that in only a 10-year time frame, a third of the 50-year third of the 50-year loss over a 10-year time frame, and that's expressed in the annual loss rate when you look at it on an average annual basis. It, you know, you have more than a 50% increase if you look at that shorter time. So the question is, is this something that's going to remain the same? What's the future look like for Flagler County? Is it going to look like the 50-year period or the more recent 10-year period that we've seen? It really will be a function of the, of the storm activity moving forward. There are some, there are some uh, resources to the north that we need to be mindful of in planning projects. Lots of questions about these I understand. However, uh, we do want to acknowledge that they exist and it do, it, these are subject for future discussion with the resource agencies as we move forward in project planning. What does this mean for future project planning? What can you, what will you be allowed to do in these areas? And there, there's a lot of debate. We've made assumptions in our report, but clearly, I think if you read the report, we do say that future coordinations with the federal and state resource agencies are required to put a plan together and really understand how these will affect project planning moving forward. Chris, we could here's a point where we could talk about that. I'm happy to, happy to talk <clears> about that. <throat> because the rocks, the coquina rock issue, and you and I have discussed it at length, uh, as, the, as you quite accurately pose the rules, if the rock is uncovered, we can't cover it back up again. But that's what troubles me, because those rocks were never exposed, ever, until Matthew. And then they were uncovered. So nature uncovered them, and it just seems to me that it's logical that we should be able to cover them back up, because right now they're being covered again by nature. That's we're right. accreting sand in that area, and they're being covered again. So they're not really they don't really lend themselves to the argument of their uh, natural resource for fish or something like that because they're not even there, but maybe four or five months of the year. So I, I know it's your position and you're just following the rules, but you, you don't think it's worth the effort to go to Tallahassee and try to get them to agree to do that? No, I think, I think it's definitely worth, I know they're aware of it. I've had discussions with them uh, right. because I've asked them what their position would be, and as, as we've talked and before. And I know what it is. They yeah. really don't take a position until you put something in writing. However, they do put point to other examples of other types of resources in the state of Florida. And gosh, you know, over my 30 years experience doing this, I've <laughs> had the unfortunate opportunity to be involved in many projects with hard bottom resources. Right. And it is a, it is a maddening and, and difficult process to navigate. And, and more information is better. Uh, one of the problems with the rocks here, so the, the, the condition you're describing of the rocks come and go is that's an ephemeral type system. And, and that is something that is acknowledged by the, the resource agencies that, and, and they consider that in their review of those resources. Hey, does it come and go? How often, how often is it exposed? How often is it covered? Uh, and then they, th through that process, they can uh, evaluate what they believe the quality and, and how, how important that resource is. And so, mapping more information is better and so the mapping and quantification of that process is important. Right. I, I think it's critical that we map it we're gonna yes. have to we're gonna have to do that but but can you give us a definition or what the difference is between the the rock the individual rock we see and what and hard bottom well it's kind of one of the same hard bottom um, typically typically the things grow and there are things that grow on this rock even algae 
which surprisingly, I'm an engineer. I've been accused of thinking like an engineer too much in environmental meetings because I don't, I have historically not valued what the importance of this. But there are things like even the algae, could juvenile green turtles use this as foraging area? Or is it, are these nursery areas for certain types of juvenile fish? And so you have two, two real resource groups that protect these things. One is the state of Florida, uh, which is really looking at it from the perspective of they are sovereign, sovereign submerged land resources and what is the value to the state of Florida? <coughs> what is the value to the public? Is there a public test here that has to be met? Uh, the fishing industry, for example, do they have value in that? And then the other is, um, is the National Marine Fisheries Service. Under the Magnuson-Stevenson Fisheries Act, uh, they, are, uh, they will look at it uh, from the perspective of essential fish habitat and are there species of concern that use this area? And right now there's not enough data for them to make a determination. So their first, their first question would be is like, well, tell me what's there. And so that's where the mapping comes in. So from a planning perspective here, it's just important to realize that it's here, uh, that it will have to be acknowledged, but the quality and what it will ultimately turn into be will be part of the project formulation process and the project planning process moving forward. Will they consider a trade-off in habitat improvement because we, by, yeah, I mean, by, doing, lots by of ways covering to those rocks, but then we're providing much more habitat for the sea turtles, for sea life, for birds, for... Yes, there's compensating that. habitat uh, right. issues okay. that, you, that, that definitely can be considered. And they, they go through this process of the agencies do. It's like wetlands. You know, they value a wetland and they say, okay, what is the value of that wetland? Right. How can that are there other ways to mitigate that uh, if there's any impact to it? Maybe some of it you may not have to be mitigated or they devalue the habitat so much that it's a de minimis type activity. But it, you have to go through a quantifying exercise to get to that point. Right, right. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. so that kind of summarizes the slide there. Uh, but it, it, it does encompass about 7.6 miles of area that would need to be, uh, that, that we are aware this does occur and that would need to be incorporated in any type of, of, of future surveys and study. I would admit that, that because it's ephemeral in nature, more than one survey would be required. You want to demonstrate the seasonality. And so uh, we, we're involved in this in South Florida in, Brevard, in Broward County right now where we're doing surveys of the rock four times a year because it does vary. And one of the things we've struggled with in the past was demonstrating to these agencies that it's a naturally dynamic system and it's not a static system. So we need to consider that in the permitting and those studies in South Florida are ongoing. Alternative developments, just kind of talk real quick about what we did. We looked at the, the scope of the plan projects, what you currently have, and kind of the magnitude of those, looking for consistency between things that have already been scoped for that. Now we are using uh, probably what would be considered the older versions of this, and, and some of this stuff would need to be updated just to increase the volumes potentially, but nonetheless, we're still doing a planning study. And we know from when we get to the engineering phase that there, could, there will be changes to the scope of our projects. But when you do a planning study, you really try to be narrow in your alternatives so you can do comparative analysis. And you kind of limit the number of iterations that you have to look at. And so we wanted to bracket what the answer is. Historical condition, historical sand loss rates, it's interesting to know what, how do we, what we're proposing to put, how does it compare to what's been lost and how fast do we think it will leave in the future? Beach restoration is a sacrificial type activity. You know you have a naturally eroding beach. Your infrastructure, if you let it go un, untreated, that erosion will eventually get to your infrastructure. So beach restoration and dune restoration is the act of pushing that problem seaward away from your infrastructure, your developed areas and your roadways and maintaining that dynamic condition away from your infrastructure. That doesn't say when you do it that you, it will stop erosion. Actually, you're just feeding the beast to protect your infrastructure is really what you're doing. And that's, uh, we're interested in what that rate has been historically and what it might be as we face sea level rise. Um, we are already seeing in a lot of the gauges around the Southeast US that these changes are occurring and we are seeing accelerations in the water level water levels uh, based upon the historical rate. Hit, hit, sea level has been ri rising for the last 15,000 years. And for the last 100 years, it was rising at about one foot per century. The question is, moving forward, is not will sea level rise, it will be what will be the rate of sea level rise moving forward, and will that accelerate above background conditions and we test that in the study. We look at that just under some scenario development just to see how does that affect the ultimate outcome of potential project alternatives. 
Um, we're looking again to look and construct and maintain for a 50 year period, different construction methodologies from the dredging to the upland sand sources, um, location and extent of the rock, how might that affect it? And then we're looking at dune conditions and enhancements, particularly in that northern part of the county, can we add sand or will we want to add sand to increase those elevations? Going to try to digest this real quick and you guys can study it on your own. But the colors are important. So if you look in the top left there, the 44, 32, 25, 16, 10, and 6 are filled densities. That's cubic yards per foot. So 44 is bigger. That's a bigger beach. And that's about what the federal government in that 2.4 mile, 2.6 miles where the core project is, that's what their fill volume was uh, historically. I think it's increasing quite a bit now. But for this study, we stuck with the 44. Um, if there was any increase in sand volume at all, you would just scale this stuff up linearly probably. you just make it all bigger, which means more money. But nonetheless, for this, um, we're looking at it from this perspective. Uh, so the pink areas are 32. The yellow and the pink are assumed to be constructible by dredge. The greens uh, are your truck haul, where this, the sectional fill volume is so small it cannot be constructed by dredge. Um, typically, we look at anything less than about 20 cubic yards per foot is not cost effective to construct by dredge. And so that's a rule of thumb that we use internally and we've applied to this study. And again, we're framing it so we look at, if you look around the, the areas where there's green, we've looked from extremes of a, a small truck haul all the way up to dredging. And those are the ranges of, of alternatives we've looked at, so we bracket that. I would, we, I would think if we win the Coquina Rock argument even a little bit, we could go to R37 with dredge sand. Yeah, that's very we possible. Could. That's very I mean, possible. That would, yeah, I mean, obviously you want to go with you want to go as far as you can with the dredge. Right. Yeah, that's going well, to be your best possible. I think R thirty-seven maybe is the northern most yeah. part we could get to, but that is still that's the Coquina Rock issue, and those are that's the area where it's covered almost all the year. And I think anyway. your goal would be to to put as much sand on the beach by dredge as you possibly right. can. Exactly. Yeah, right. that that would obviously be a goal. Right. Um, and however, I think some of the assumptions that have been made in here kind of bracket that. You'd find yourself somewhere in this range of costs probably. Um, if you ultimately implement a project like that. And, and you, you talk about it in here, but you don't specifically talk about uh, amassing a huge pile of sand like at Washington Oaks Park, dredge sand. You talk about it, but yeah, so number I, four I think is that's, that, a, that's an issue. Yeah, number four is that guy. Um, uh, where, where alternative four, where you see the stockpile. So the concept right. there is that we would be building those, those black hatched areas by dredge. Yeah. and subsequently transferring that Then we can move material. it around. Yeah, yeah so in, in the cost assumptions that we've made in this, we based upon a, an experience we've had at Patrick Air Force Base in Brevard County, where they also have a similar rock issue. And Jason can probably talk more about this as well. It's a federal project. We're the, we're the sponsor and they helped design it. But that was the same type thing. They were trying to avoid the rock. They wanted to use dredge sand, so they created these, these stockpiles. But there's a lot of rehandling that goes on with this. And so the costs really go up because of those multiple phases of work. Nonetheless, uh, Faith was very insistent that we, we include this, and so we did. And, uh, and so that, that's just another, another option to point to in terms of an approach that's been included in the framing of what the ultimate approach and cost might be. Then if we look at future maintenance, this is, again is what we would expect the maintenance to look like. Uh, again, same type format, colors are a little different where we would build stuff by dredge and we would build it by truck haul or rehandling. Um, it's, it's intended to, it's a complicated graphic. We tried to make simple, but um, uh, it, if you kind of follow the guide of the fill densities and where we say uh, material is, we can be placed by dredge and it can't be placed by dredge, it should be pretty self-evident. Uh, and all these um, have been used to frame the cost and I'll get into that a little bit about the renourishment, the frequency that the sand has to be placed. And big picture, uh, with, with a dredge, we're assuming we're going to be on the same schedule as the core, which their current plan for the federal project is every 11 years. So it would ideally, Flagler County would be in a position to be able to piggyback off their mobilization at the time and put as much sand on the beach as possible by dredge. Where you're not allowed to put sand or where you can't put sand by dredge, you would have to defer to one of these truckle options and you may have to do it more frequently to maintain some suitable condition. And that's really detailed in the report. I didn't want to get too far into it in this discussion today. Um, but really to sand total, this is kind of interesting on how we've um, we framed it because obviously sand volume is where your cost is. You're buying sand. We're in the sand business here. 
You have the initial restoration, the way you read this graph. You have this, the, the five alternatives. Actually, you have the six alternatives. Um, the, the options from the previous two graphics where we have our total initial placement, either hydraulically placed or mechanically placed. This could change. Uh, these volumes could change. You could switch mechanical for hydraulic and vice versa, depending upon what the ultimate project is. But again, these do frame the potential options, and I believe no matter where, where you ultimately land with a project approach, you're going to be somewhere in this ballpark. But really what we're looking at is what was the initial volume and then what would be required for the future. Future is maintenance. Once you've established a project, it's going to erode. You're going to have to replace the eroded sand on some frequency, whether it's a hydraulic placement every 11 years, mechanical, either every 11 years or every three years is what we've assumed in this thing in the report. But what we're really looking for is the total. Why the total is important over a 50-year period is where does that sand come from? So we know we're going to need between 9 and 11 million yards of sand. That's a, that's a big number for 18 miles. Where does it come from? It could be bigger than this, too, if, if the core is right and their volume is going to increase. But nonetheless, uh, we're looking at some range. And so we would want to apply, apply some safety factors. To this. Let's, let's double it. Then we need 18 to 22 million yards over the next 50 years. Some, and that might even get you into some of your post-storm activities. Say you have another Matthew and you need a storm response using FCCE money or, or, or FEMA money, you would want to go back and make sure you had enough sand to address those uh, possible events as well. These do change with, uh, with sea level rise. If you look at it over a 50-year period, we've uh, very quickly looked at the totals and what that might mean. There's increases, and this is just for alternative three, uh, we could do this for all the alternatives. In fact, in the report, we do. But it just shows that, hey, if we pick one of these, either the intermediate or the high uh, from the NOAA, the current guidance on sea level rise for this area of the world, these are the types of increases you might see because if you have increases in water level, it takes more volume to compensate for those increases of, of, of water level. And this is what the typical guidance would suggest based upon the rules that are applied same, same guidance that the Corps uses, so you would expect the same types of results with their project as well. Implicitly, their project is in, our, is in these numbers. Sand sources. So we've talked about, and I know you guys have been familiar with, okay, the offshore sand versus the upland sand. So let's talk about the offshore sand first. Uh, lots of work over the last 20 or some years in Flagler County about what are the options that are available to you. After drilling down on many, many options over time and working with the Corps of Engineers, this area, area 3 and sub-area 3A have been identified as the most probable areas of sand that can be used in Flagler County. Both the Corps and Flagler County currently have permits to use sand from this area, so that's a big test that is suitable for, to the state of Florida for the placement along the Flagler, Flagler County beaches. Um, and we know, too, there's, there's lots of other options for upland mines, but just the, in, in the cost of using those and the distance and just the effort to use those, we do know, is difficult and, and expensive. So the offshore sand search is, a, is pretty interesting. Uh, we look at, we, would, we drill down into Area 3 and 3A here, and, and I'm going to get into some of these different dot colors later in the, in the presentation, but those are, those are vibra cores. Those are where we've tested the sand. But what we want to look at principally here are those areas uh, delineated by the green boundary. We've looked at the overall shoal feature in this area A, which was identified long ago in the course feasibility study. Uh, but there's, and we've looked at areas where it, it's shaded in a color. That's where the sand above minus, above minus 62 and a half is thicker than four feet. And that's important because that's access, considered accessible by a hopper dredge. Uh, there's, there could be more sand here, but we've made this assumption because the bottom elevation of our bar site that we've permitted for Flagler County is 62 and a half. And so from a planning perspective, we've used that number and assumed that most of the sand above 62 and a half is going to be beach compatible. And if you look within 3A, we have almost 15 million yards available, if we can think back to what the need was earlier. But if you look at all of 3A, there's you know, more than 40 million yards of sand available in these shaded areas, which is a good thing for Flagler County. It means you have this source that is available to you, and it clearly is, you can see the Flagler of the Lucia County line, it is offshore of your community, and although people might come after it, but you would have a good stand 
based on precedent in the state of Florida to say that that needs to be used in Flagler County. Construction methods, we've reviewed this before. A clearly offshore would be used. The hopper dredge, because it's about 12 miles offshore, is a ship where it's like a big vacuum cleaner, goes in the hold, comes to the beach, pumps out hydraulically. Truck haul is pretty self-explanatory. A truck shows up with sand and dumps it on the beach. Uh, much more complicated. And it's, the, the, uh, the, the, the production rates are very low, which does affect cost. So a dredge, although it's expensive to mobilize, it's moving, it orders a magnitude of sand on a daily basis more than a truck haul. Uh, 10, 10 to 15 times more per day, probably, than a truck haul type approach. So that's where the efficiencies come in with the, with the dredge approach. Even, even though your construction site is, is 12 miles, I mean your bar site is 12 miles offshore. Construction method, why we wanted to point this out also are the stockpile method. Uh, these are the pictures from Brevard County just this past year. Um, and you can see where the sand had been dumped in this big pile in front of these condos for subsequently rehandling mechanically. And you can see the excavator and the trucks in here. So the dredge comes in and builds this, the dredge leaves and hands it over to the, to the land-based guys and they move it mechanically. They had the, they had the luxury in, in, in Brevard in this instance that the dredge had other things to do so it could leave and go do its other work while, while they, they, they whittled away at this stockpile, which did help in the cost um, one thing to be careful of with the stockpile is to make sure that the, the dredge doesn't sit standby waiting for the mechanical process to finish up. So that's a detail way down the road. But it is, it is something that has been tested and we know how to do it. So it's something that should be considered in Flagler County. Probable cost of element. This is, this is important. Uh, we're looking at pro, pro, uh, project volumes is a big part of the cost. How much does it place the cost to place sand on the beach? We've looked at the market conditions of similar projects. We look at as, as, as recent as bids op, bid openings in St. Johns County that were within the last six months uh, for, for Corps of Engineers projects there at, at um, South Panabedra and in Volano Beach, uh, borrow sites you know, offshore, similar, very, very similar type project. And so this is a good litmus test for what our assumptions are. The mitigation costs, clearly we've made assumptions in this report uh, that, uh, that are subject to further consideration as we move forward uh, in the planning of this and the coordination with the agencies, but we had to make some assumptions and we did it. And so that's a starting point. Planning, engineering, design, construction, and monitoring, that's all kind of a, just almost a percentage wise at a planning type level. Because of the level of uncertainty and assumptions that we're making, we always like to throw a contingency on top of our costs. So when you look at these costs in here, you need to consider what is the basis of this cost development and, and, and understand that these are trying to represent order of magnitude uh, for, to get you thinking in the right direction of what we're looking at. Um, and so from, from an alternative comparison perspective, we want to bring everything to the equal playing field uh, from cost, so we come up with an equivalent annual cost. That's where you look at all the events that occur over a 50-year period, bring it back to present work using some assumptions, of a 50 year planning horizon and using a discount rate. That's the currently, the, the federal government's discount rate for planning projects is what we used uh, to bring everything. And then you come, come up with an annualized cost. And that way you can intercompare these different alternatives from an annual requirement. How much money on an annual basis do I have to plan for to cover this 50 year period? Understanding that I'm gonna spend the money in periodic discrete events through time. That's as far as my finance expertise goes, by the way. So anyway, I would recommend getting finance people involved once you get to that point. So the total cost summary <laughs> and the equivalent annual cost is summarized like this in the report. We're looking at total volume. You can see the alternatives, then the volume, projects that might have impacts to hard bottom. Uh, what is the total cost for the initial construction? What is the future cost of each of these events to maintain the project through time? Present worth all that and get an average annual cost. So. What this would mean is that you would have an initial cost for 18 miles between 70 and 137 million dollars. And let me put that in perspective. And uh, so as a rule of thumb, scale is everything with cost. As a rule of thumb, what we've always, I, I've always observed for beach nourishment projects that are comprehensive in nature like this one, is the projects are cost about five to seven million dollars a mile with a dredge. That's just what they cost. And I think you could test everything throughout the Southeast US, US and you're gonna come up with a number somewhere between five and seven million dollars a mile. So when you apply that to 18 miles of shoreline, you come up with some numbers that are very similar to this. 
We put a lot more effort into these cost analysis, but you could do that. I just did that in 30 seconds using some assumptions based on a historical data set. So scale was everything. 18 miles is ambitious. And so, but it is, it is a community-wide effort. And so these are the types of numbers that are not unreasonable when you put it in perspective of, 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 a, of a unit basis on cost per mile. Chris, uh, one of the criticisms we get, and it's not by a lot of people, but they say, why don't you evaluate the do nothing option? And what is what does that cost? Well, it, we yeah, get criticized. I mean, I, it, we yeah, get criticized yeah, no, for that. No, yeah. I mean, um, you know, we we tried to target this because it was a dune and it was a dune and beach, you know, management program. Clearly, a do nothing is a management perspective. We leaned on the Corps feasibility study from ten years ago as they tested the no action alternative. Ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, the erosion's not going away. So you're either going to sacrifice a project or you're going to sacrifice existing upland and dune. And eventually that's going to not be acceptable to the community because you're going to start having infrastructure impacts. And you've already had some already through some of these storms, and so you really know what those look like. The problem is not going away. And that's, so that's all I wanted to hear. I just Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, and, and, and and I don't we don't propose that. Okay. I just want to hear it okay. say yeah. that's a bad yeah. idea. That's well and, and everything all the science points to the problem getting worse in the future with sea level rise. So um, you know, we're continuing to watch that to see if that truly does materialize, but most communities are making plans for that to happen from all of their planning, all their critical infrastructure as well as their beach and dunes. Just, just, uh, yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that apparently seems to be working pretty well is the mile, 1.1 mile wall we put in the large tubes that went down at the northern end of Flagler Beach. Did, did any of your possibilities take into consideration doing something like that in a larger area? Yeah, so the, the, the wall is, uh, two, two points on the wall. The wall was, is, is located pretty far landward. DOT has an opportunity to do things that, in some of the areas of the county, we would not have, particularly if it's seaward of the Coastal Construction Control Line. Um, their, their state has rules about what's permittable, seaward of the control line, uh, regarding walls. And so you have to have critically threatened infrastructure. And that could be private houses and things. And right now, uh, and some of those walls were built right after uh, Matthew uh, and, and Beverly Beach and Painters Hill. There were some walls put in where they got back to that threshold. But there are other areas of the, of the county right now that don't qualify for that. But also in front of the wall, there's a very robust dune uh, and beach in front of it. And so it is not interacting with the waves and, and water right now. Uh, that could change very quickly if we had a big storm. However, the, the road would be protected, and which is which was important. So. I think uh, to follow up on Dave's question, we've been looking at this, and I, I mean, there's parts there's parts of our beach that lend themselves to seawalls, Caja Beach, uh, uh, Bay Drive Park, and Sea Colony in particular could use. We could because of the, the size of the beach and doesn't allow for a lot of sand to be put there. We could, that could be a, a, a solution. Um, Faith Al-Khatib, yes, it is one of the solution to build the seawall in some of these areas. The cost will be very expensive, but I do remember after Matthew, FDOT, they came in and they recommend to build a seawall for 2.6 miles within the city of Lager Beach area, and the residents there, they did not agree on this approach. So that's why later you can see from us coming in with some kind of uh, mechanism to do public outreach, do a survey, see what the public they would like to consider, and it can be another alternative here, but it's not gonna be a cheap one. But our recommendation to save our beaches, it might be a combination, building a wall and also do a nourishment project. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying, I think we need we need to consider, there are some places where it just lends itself. And, and the public input is important. And Chris, I'm surprised you didn't do a public input as part of your, as part of your deal. You could have included that in here, but, but it probably wasn't in the scope of the dollars that we gave you. But, uh, but anyway, so yeah, just as long as these, this report does not, does not consider hardening at all. And I think we need to consider that. 
we can add it to our report as an alternative. The public education and outreach, uh, it is, I think he did talk about it part of the report, but this is one of the things I'm going to be discussing it with you, what's next, the next steps, because it's related to understand what the public, they want us to do out there. We included part of this study to public meetings, the one which we did February 2022, and the second one, but we barely heard anything from the public. Uh, we posted the report on the website. We got some input from you and some of the people who attended, which is approximately a handful of people. But it's going to be a specific, a specific phase, public education, outreach, and a survey. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to talk about the scope of what we did also with respect to walls. So I think I mentioned this at the very beginning is we looked at what we believe you would get a permit to do. And we and so one of the tests, particularly uh, in, in from, from the state of Florida, is will your activity have an adverse effect to the coastal system? And so if that's seaward of the control line, you have to have a reason, which is according to state rule and law right now, is you have to be protecting infrastructure to do that. So it has to be threatened. Honestly, it, it, it's a really weak test. I mean, you, you got to, I mean, a strong test. It has to be really close, 25 feet or a five-year storm uh, to be able to put a wall out in front of this. And so, uh, yeah, for structures built, at, yeah, and the structures built after 85. So it's, we were looking for ways that you would you restore your beach and dune system using things that we believe you could get a permit for. Now, you can do whatever you want to land one of the control line. If the Flagler County says, look, we want to go put walls behind a control line, the state of Florida doesn't have any doesn't have any control over that. So is there room behind the control line to do that? That is not something we looked at. It's clearly something that can be considered. But I would just warn you that if you wanted to try to do walls, see where the control line is a pretty pretty heavy lift to do that. And they vary, it, it, and it's really a black and white decision. There's not a lot of gray area when it comes to dealing with that from the state's perspective. And they've done that on purpose because the regulators have all requests from all over the state to do yeah, this. We were successful in Painters Hill. Correct, but you met the threshold. You met the threshold. You met there. the threshold. That's correct. Right. Yep. Yeah, yes, sir. So, um, yeah, so this is the range, and you can see that last one at the bottom here, that 15 million, and I've seen it in some of the newspaper articles. We did have a very aggressive estimate on what we thought the hard bottom issues would be. And, and these are based upon assumptions that we made. We had very limited data when we did this. We had some, some buzzy aerial photography is what we had. Uh, and we, but we needed to come up with an estimate. And we basically used the information we had. There was no survey data. And we estimated an area that we thought might be impacted by a project of that scale which is a process you have to go through in the regulatory it's called an equilibrium toa fill study that you have to project where you think the fill will, will reach to under the water uh, we estimated in the search area 7.6 miles again scale is everything that's a long that's a long reach of shoreline uh, and then we estimated a cost based upon other examples in the state of Florida for the type of mitigation that has been used in other equivalent examples. All up to debate, all up clearly up to more detailed surveys, which would obviously refine that number. Surveys can go both ways. They can make it better for you, they can make it worse for you. But nonetheless, these again are assumptions I intended to bracket, but you can see where we were, even where we had some mitigation, you were looking at an equivalent total cost of these projects between eight and $10 million, more or less, on an annual basis. Sea level rise also has an effect of that, just like, just like it does volume. Clearly, sea level rise is going to affect cost because you're placing more sand. And so if there is any additional conversation about adding more sand, gosh, you know, the, 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 um, the surveys you use were old. There's, we need more sand now than we did. Okay, that's, that's fine it's gonna be more expensive. So you're just buying more cubic yards to meet this baseline objective. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, as, as those are considered. But again, you know, it's a pretty significant increase in cost if we do, if these, these sea level rise uh, uh, changes do materialize. However, the nice thing about sea level rise, it doesn't happen all at once and you can kind of see it coming. And so through over a 50 year period, and a lot of communities are doing that, they're not making their long-term projections over 50 years, they're doing, it. They're doing it incrementally, uh, particularly with beach nourishment, because you get about every 10 years, you get another shot at it and what's happened in the last 10 years. And so that's something to keep in mind. But again, planning study, we had to come up with something. 
so we so we understand what it might mean is what the point of that was so cost sharing <clears throat> let me ask you something real quick we're we're talking about um, the beach renourishment and we're we've got the Army Corps part I guess the setup with that is very expensive because I know when we do that's right construction the setup is probably some of the most time-consuming and most expensive part would it not be smart to try to see how we can piggyback off that how we can extend it and um, I, I don't want to delay that because I think that Army Corps area needs to get done immediately Right. We need to get moving. We, we've talked about it for a long time now, and it's it's time to get going with it. But at the end of the day, but that's what we're doing. We're piggybacking, yeah. you know, the, to the our FDOT project is going to use the same dredge, use the same all setup. So, but yeah, it, and if we can extend it, like I said, up to yeah. up to Jungle Hut, if yeah. we could keep using it and get up to Jungle Hut, that'd be great. But there's yeah, a few, time, with time few roadblocks to that. You're exactly right. I mean, mo it's called the mobilization cost. I mean, they, they, these. They're usually between five and seven, I mean, three and seven million dollars, depending on the complexity of your project. Well, I think we've estimated based on the core's numbers. And, we, and the prices were very similar that just came in in South Ponte Vedra, around three and a half, four million dollars for the mobilization. So clearly, the more sand you put once you mobilize the dredge, the cheaper the sand is. Right. And so that, that is something that is, is a goal. And we, uh, Commissioner Hansen is exactly right that we're, we're per, uh, hoping to be able to do that with the coming project, with the permits we have, and get it all the way through the city of Flagler Beach. We don't have the permits now uh, we won't, uh, or the funding available to extend it any farther than that. So there might be a one-off event in the future where we have to pay for our own mobilization to extend it. But in these assumptions that we've made in our cost, I'm assuming that you're piggybacking everything. But what I'm saying is if, if we, like the Army Corps project, I think realistically, I don't know why we're not starting it within the next 12 to 18 months, but to be able to fund the rest of those miles at that price may take five, ten years. I don't, I mean, unless, that's a lot of money. That's well, what I'm saying. Don't you know, we, we could, not, I mean, we you can clearly start, you, you could extend that project all the way up to, to uh, Varn Park without debate, is my opinion. Um, uh, there's no evidence of any resources in those areas that would cause an ex a protracted conversation in the permitting phase. Right. Uh, so clearly, I mean, one of the things the county could do right now is like, hey, let's go modify our permits and extend them up to Varn Park, even if we don't place sand there. That's that's definitely something you could you could choose to do. And then depending upon when the core project happens, you might have this permit. You may not get this permit as quickly as you like, but it might be worth asking a question. I'm not worried about the permits as much as I am about the funding. Okay. Well, the funding's yeah, the next step. Yeah. That's right. You would, you would need the funding as well. I don't want well. one project to hold because funding of another one you know, well, you don't need to have the funding identified to get the permits, so which is a good thing. And it's nice to have the permits in hand. Yeah, um, I agree. And with that. so that's the easy part. That that's that's the easy part, and and clearly not the most expensive part. But it is nice to have the permits because it gives you flexibility. How much? Um, well, we we um, I don't know. I don't want to put it on the spot. <laughs> I'm just worried about with the ever-changing environment in the federal government that that funding could disappear one day, even though they say, hey, it's here one day. I've seen these That's projects a possibility. all of a sudden disappear. So get it while it's there is my... I think that's a great idea. I did ask Chris how much it will cost us to start the design and permitting process. He said, oh, I don't know. As an example, for FDOT project 2.4 miles for design and permitting and easement is costing us $1.8 million at this time. This is my contract with Olson Associates two years ago or three years ago. So just to give you an idea how much funding do we need just to start working on some of these tasks. And that does include the sand search portion of it. So um, there's that's why I kind of hesitated. Is like how much Faith has asked me some other questions about expanding the sand source for other purposes, and so we would have to go back and look at the whole thing. There would be some more environmental work, but it's and it could be that I, when I hesitate too. We could just modify your existing permit, and that's not as complicated as a whole new permit. So it would take up some strategies on on how to minimize that cost of Flagler County. So it's definitely something to worth if you want to ask about how to do that. We can give you more specific feedback on what that would cost and kind of the time frame to do that. Um, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so cost sharing is a, 
is a tricky one here. Um, cost sharing, there are cost sharing opportunities, as you know from the Corps of Engineers, uh, also from the state of Florida, that right now there's a $50 million dedicated funding source to the state of Florida. Uh, that The legislature is very reliable uh, from their Beach and Dune uh, program statewide. You do have to compete for, with those, for those dollars, but they, both the federal and the state programs require local input. And that's a problem that uh, Flagler has struggled with up until this point is to identify that local source of funding. Uh, but to maximize these opportunities in the future, a local funding source will be required. Um, and that is gonna be a community-wide effort to determine what the source of that money will be. But for the purposes of this study, what I wanted to demonstrate is if you maximized your cost-sharing opportunities, what would that look like to Flagler County? Uh, and maximizing um, for the course opportunities as well as the state of Florida um, is what we looked at. And so <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it will be a Flagler County responsibility, but it will be a stakeholder responsibility. Lots of these different communities have lots of ways they generate this revenue. Um, and so <laughs> you'll, you'll see a recommendation at the end on, on a study to look at this. And there's every, every opportunity is different and every community is different on how you choose to do it. So I'm not really making any recommendations other than it's something that you need to consider moving forward. So when, some of our basic assumptions in these cost sharing, where you have eligible uh, shorelines that are eligible for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers cost sharing <coughs> for the beach and dune, the initial construction you'll get up to, 60, up to 65%, and I say up to meaning if you have all the available parking and access to allow the public to access those portions of the project, for the purposes of this study, we're gonna maximize that. We're just gonna be whimsical and say that, that we're gonna get everything that we're, we're eligible for. Um, and, but for future events and those maintenance events in the future, you're only eligible for 50% federal. But you're in the game. And the nice thing about being in the federal program too is should you get hit by a, a, a storm event, they come back at 100% and repair it at no cost to the local communities. So. I've, I've said this to Faith for years, getting in the game is quite important because there's so many opportunities once you're in the game uh, from the core and from FEMA to, to maintain your project. From DEP, through this dedicated funding source that the state has, it's at $50 million right now. There's always efforts to expand this. You do have to compete for it with all the other coastal communities in the state of Florida. Um, and it, it funds everything from studies like this. They would have paid 50% of the study um, if you, should you have qualified. Um, and, and all the way to monitoring to construction. And, and there's all these different phases that you go through to do that, but you have to put the, the local half up. And Chris, so we, Chris, the issue is critically eroded beaches. And we need, it to, is, we it need is. to get our beaches, because now the big number says 50, 30, 45%, but that's all Flagler Beach. We have that one little piece of critically eroded north yeah. of... of uh, yeah, where, where that stop, stops. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so we need to get more of our beaches designated as critically eroded. Well, I will say on your behalf, since I've been working for you every year, I submit the most recent survey data we have to the state, and they are the ones who do this. I just did this I know six that. months yeah. ago. Yeah. And I go back to Guy Weeks and say, Guy, here's the latest survey we have. I even gave him the post Nor'easter data. Guy, what do we got? I mean, where, where, can, we, can we expand this? It's as simple as making a phone call and sending Guy some data. And he responded back and said, you're not meeting the threshold at this point for these other areas. So it's something a recommendation would be is keep sending guy that data. Every time we have an event, let's send in the data. Let's, let's make sure that the state is aware of this, of your interest. And so uh, we send them the whole county and they look at the whole county every time. And so that it's a simple request and they're very responsive to that. Uh, but where you do have critically eroded beaches, um, you're eligible up to 50% of those costs. Uh, and, um, you know, you do have to have public access to those areas as well. It's, the threshold is not as strict as it is for the core, but, but you do st still have a public access test for public funding. It's only fair when you're using public money that's not generated in the community. Other people have access to your resource, which is the beach. So um, what we did is it, we tried to, and this is in the report, and I'm trying to simplify this again. So there's three versions here of what you currently have eligible. The pink is where you currently have your critically eroded designations. So this is the existing condition. And so in that pink area, you're, you can, you're eligible. If you do something in those areas, you're eligible up to 50% state money. 
The, the purple is where you have your Corps of Engineers project. Clearly, you got 65% initial cost uh, coming from the feds. Um, and in the future, it would be 50% uh, would be the assumption. And then the green, these are the two state parks, Gamble Rogers as well as Washington Oaks. That's 100% state. So if there's ever any activity, in fact, in our project in the southern part of the county right now, uh, there's some post-Matthew money that's still available, about $2.5, $2.7 million that will be used at 100% state for the sand that's placed in Gamble Rogers. And so this is the existing cost share scenario that we have. And what we want to do is look at this, and then we want to make some assumptions moving forward. Because the question is, is how can we improve our cost sharing opportunities? So if we, if we go through this, going back to our total average annual cost, our equivalent annual cost, from seven, you know, eight to um, say ten million dollars. We'll ignore the fifteen for now. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at the local share, and this is looking at your maximizing your current core of engineers cost sharing opportunities, maximizing your DEP opportunities. Every assuming every you're replacing sand everywhere is critically eroded, and you're getting fifty percent state match. And then there is a DOT grant right now. It's a post Matthew grant. And that's why, it's, that's why it's fixed for every one of these is because it's a, assumed to be at this time a one-shot deal from DOT. There's no assumptions of future DOT money in the future. However, maybe that's always available, particularly if you have a storm event. So we, we can't, we're not counting on it for here. So that's how we get to this local share. And this is what, on an average annual basis, this range, if you were to do all 18 miles for these scenarios that we have assumed, that you're looking at this range of local revenue that have to, would have to be available to carry the debt and to, get it, to carry the cost over time. Clearly, you would be spending money in these discrete points in time, having to bond it and do other types of things and, and, and get loans and pay it back over time. But, and this is not out of the ordinary for communities that have this much shoreline under their control, 18 miles. For example, uh, the town of Hilton Head Island is a long time. I've been working with them for 30 years. They have a dedicated funding source of a local revenue, uh, a, a bed tax at 2%, and they generate between seven and $11 million a year local revenue from that. They pay 100%. They have no state or Corps of Engineers money, and they're spending on an average annual basis about six to $7 million a year, and that's for 16 miles. And so <clears throat> they are 35 years into it now, and so we really, are, we really know this a mature program and we see what these costs are on an average basis. So that's also been a litmus test for us internally in our office to say, hey, does this make sense compared to other examples of the same magnitude? And to us, the answer was yes. It's order of magnitude about where you need to be talking when you start these conversations about what is the need. So can we reduce this demand on the locals and shove it off to our cost sharing partners. Again, we got our current plan. Let's look at if we were to fill that small gap in uh, <coughs> Beverly Beach and Painters Hill of uh, the pink, we extend the pink. This is the area that I always go back to Guy Weeks and say, we need to bridge that gap. And it's possible, there's two tests for, for um, critical erosion. One is the definition of hey, is erosion is, is the infrastructure designated as critical? Is it is it threatened? Or you have this continuity of management, and there was a gap. Used to, about three years ago, there was a gap also in the northern part of the city of Flagler Beach where there was a gap in the critical erosion. It never met the test. But when we applied for permits and Flagler County demonstrated they intended to restore and maintain that beach, they were able to use the continuity of management criteria to fill the gap. I still believe that if the, if the county were to apply for permits all the way up to Varn Park and beyond, that we can go back to them and make a, con make a continuity management argument, but they won't make that decision until they have the permits and have the plan in front of them. That's what they told me last time, and that's what they did, but they did come around for us, and they filled the gap, the previous gap. So this is another scenario. The only change we're making is filling that gap. Then we're going to look at if uh, the core sharpens their pencil and they everywhere we, we filled the gap with critical erosion and we expanded the federal project all the way up to Varn Park, so all the way through Painter's Hill and all the way through Beverly Beach, what would that cost sharing scenario look like uh, by adding these two areas here? <clears throat> We'd also extend it down to the county line. And then we will look at 
this is this is not reality, but I wanted to know what the number was, so I did it. As I said, every every entire 18 miles of Flagler County is critically eroded, and everywhere is eligible for the federal project except the two state parks. I really don't think this would ever materialize under existing beach conditions because the infrastructure is not there to support it. But let's, I want to know what the number is. So to do that, we used alternative three. We picked one of them. The, 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 average, the equivalent annual cost is right in the middle of our bulk, right around the total is right around eight to nine million dollars. Uh, the local share, and you can see uh, for the alternative three and their existing cost sharing scenarios is about 6.2. And you can see that there's not a big drop in that annual demand with these going all the way up to Varn Park with filling the gap at, at Painter's Hill, Beverly Beach for the critically eroded and also extending the federal project, which would be number two, uh, you drop it less than a million cubic yards per year on an average annual basis. Number, alternative three is the entire county being critically eroded and being having a federal project. It still doesn't go to zero. And that's the point we wanted to make for the county is there's still, regardless of what the scope of the project is, regardless of what you're maximizing your cost share opportunities, there's still gonna be a need for local money to, to access these funding opportunities. So it will never go to zero. And every other community in the state of Florida has local funding dedicated to supporting these programs. So, and those are who you're competing with. So um, the county will be responsible, meaning your community, not necessarily the county government, but your community will be responsible for the local share. And regardless of, as I'm just summarizing again, regardless of project scope or <clears throat> cost sharing opportunities, there's still going to be a need for this local revenue. So the funding opportunities, you know, I, I really just highlighting some of the stuff that I've seen from other communities. You guys have your own way. You might decide how to do that. It would be, does it come out of general revenue, a TDT, a local option sales tax? Uh, the special assessments, uh, the MSTU or MSBU, uh, the taxing units or the benefits units, um, where you set up special taxing districts or assessment districts to generate the money from the beneficiaries or from your community. There's examples of these we've shared with county staff from other communities that we have dealt with. Uh, there's a special taxing district. So lay the DCDD up in, in a hammock, Dunes, Ocean Hammock, and all that, those communities up there, you can set up a special taxing district. And these things used to be all over the state of Florida before the county governments got involved in leading these programs. For example, Brevard, Broward County had a Broward County Erosion Control District, and it was these special taxing districts they had um, to generate this revenue to support these programs. But they ultimately dissolved them and just incorporated all that, that administrative portion into county government. And that's what most of the counties are doing now. But <clears throat> it's still an option. You have to go get legislative develop this thing and legislative approval to establish this erosion control district. And then, you know, you could bond, another source to make it go over time would be to bond it and uh, to carry the, um, the upfront load and, and something that you would pay against over time so you have a money available to implement these initial projects. The benefits of this of other funding opportunities, once you're in the game, are the FEMA post-disaster post public assistance funding where you don't have a federal project and you have a storm, um, you're eligible for 75% of this infrastructure damage. So the beach and dune, which went built with, federal, with government money, is considered local infrastructure. And so you're eligible under their, post their public assistance funding program for 75% of the cost to put it back. And the PO 8499 uh, FCCE stuff with the core, that's 100%, but that's only applicable to the federal programs. So real quick, I want to summarize so we can get into more questions. <clears throat> One of the big steps that the county, I think, needs to decide is who's going to lead this? Who's going to be in charge? Are you, there are several ways to do it. Most counties sit at the administrative head of the program. Then they, they, they work with their stakeholders to generate the revenue to support the program. But from an administrative position, who is the local sponsor? Who is the agent for the permits? Who is responsible for collecting the money and distributing the money? typically sits in other examples in the state at the county level. However, you have a choice on what to decide on how you want to do it for your county. But if you're looking to manage all 18 miles as a collective cohesive unit, it makes sense to have one entity and responsible for that as opposed to 
distributing the responsibilities of different parties and trying to make them all work together. It's, it's good to have those people at the table, but there still needs to be an administrative head. So this is a major decision, I think, out of the study that ultimately before moving forward, the county needs to debate and decide on what they want to do, on how that wants to, And it could be that you establish a special taxing district and give that administrative, once these districts are established, they have a board, they have staff, they have their own taxing authority, and they, they administer the program. Alternatively, you, you staff up within the county level and do it internally in the county. And those, but, but the county and the special taxing districts and things like that make you eligible for these public assistance programs through the feds and through FEMA. So we need to talk about uh, with the local funding source. How do you intend to do that? The magnitude obviously is going to be debated. Uh, how much do you need to generate? How much do you want to generate? What is the scope and scale of your project? What are you going to spend? But a st identifying and, and understanding the need to establish this program kind of goes hand in hand with the government, uh, the governance administration. Uh, but setting up a program, the first two bullets are, are important of moving for moving forward. Then we get into the engineering stuff, back to the fun stuff. You got some money, you've got, you know, who's in charge now, you know who's going to be your permit agent. You give it back to the engineers and we get into the design level investigation, looking at these surveys and studies and things about how how, what will really, what will the final project look like and what will it cost and what will be um, <clears throat> required to implement that? One of the things we need to do is expand our knowledge of the offshore sand source because this is definitely a, a source we're going to rely on for a long term program in Flagler County. Uh, and it's, um, it's pretty important that we do that um, to better understand what your total quantity is and to make it available on an as needed basis moving forward. We need to know more about this rock up north so we can uh, be more specific in our decision making with that. Uh, pursue additional regulatory permits. We've talked about that during this conversation. Um, and long term easements. Clearly, this is something else that we'll need to ultimately need to get into with, with the community is having access uh, to the beach to occupy private lands and main, uh, construct and maintain the dune. Uh, beyond the federal project, it's a little easier than the federal project. Uh, but it's definitely something those right now up through the southern end of uh, town of Beverly Beach, we're getting easements all the way down. So it will be the northern 11 to 12 miles where this will need to happen pretty quickly. And some of that will need to support this Dorian thing that we're working on right now as well. Uh, so some, there is an urgency on some of that. Uh, developing countywide beach, uh, public beach access and parking inventory. This is a recommendation from Jason Hera at the core, uh, particularly if you turn back to the core looking for, hey, hey how much more federal stuff are we... Uh, are we available, eligible for, uh, Jason really likes to see this beach access and parking inventory first because it helps them do almost like a windshield look at what are your chances uh, moving forward with that. Did I say that right? That's right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and then- and, um, we're, and we're working on that now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, I, I spent time with this uh, critical erosion eligibility. That's something we'll continue to do as surveys become available. That's nothing more than hit and send on an email. Um, representing that's what you guys want to do. I think that's what you guys want to do. Uh, and then, obviously, would you do you want to pursue or engage with the core with expanding the federal project? That there's pros and cons with that. It does cost up front, one point five million dollar matching fund up front, and you don't know what the answer is going to be. So, but that would be I would turn to Jason more for his input on that um, and what the likelihood of, of some payoff in that investment. What would it be? Chris, I just had to, yes, before we leave that slide, um, just from my understanding, expand offshore sand borrow area. I'm trying to remember what you said earlier. In the, is that more core samples? Yes. Or so even even though we know there's 48 million cubic yards or whatever it was. You're gonna. Uh, I got. I got a slide for you in just a minute. Oh, okay. So <laughs> so what? So that would involve additional funding to do the additional core. That's samples. correct. Um, and it, it, do you think that's needed right now, or? I think given the conversation that we're having about uh, long-term need, uh, yes, I think it's needed now. And, I, and I'll explain that in our, okay. I, okay. yeah, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'll explain to you in more detail why that is. Um, so the immediate next steps, Faith wanted to work with me, she goes, all right, what do we need to do right now? We need to initiate this discussion about program administration. We need, you guys together, need to, to really, with staff, to really decide on how you want to do this moving forward to get, get the ball rolling. Uh, who will lead the program? Um, 
And so we can help with that. We can help. We, uh, clearly, we're available. We have other communities we can connect you with that do it a lots of different ways. And it's good to interview them. What works, what, what doesn't, what would be best for Flagler County? No, uh, <clears throat> the, you need to do it the way is best for you. But there are, there are um, examples for you. Commission of Funding Study. The funding study is this. It, and we've engaged both a funding expert as well as a PR firm. And we will have a proposal for staff next week uh, where they will look at what, is, what, are the great, what are the options for your community for funding? What, is, what are the likelihood of interest in, in the community to fund it? And what are the sources of the funding? And they will, in turn, also come back with recommendations to you. Uh, what works best with you, there's, there, there's outreach, there's engagement with staff, there's engagement with you and the community on what the scope of that might be. Uh, we are not experts in this and we defer to them to help do that who are, um, they do this every day for all these special taxing districts and this is just one more step. So you test the uh, interest of community and willingness to pay. So this is the commission of the data collection of offshore sand source. This is something that really needs to be done, and mainly because it's, it's season dependent. That's a 12 miles offshore of Flagler County is a long way from adjacent inlets. It's a, it's a hairy place to work. And so um, it's a, it, it will benefit your overall program long term, whether it's the federal project or your project, you're gonna need it eventually anyway. And it's good to invest it now. So you, and collecting the data is the most important thing. Once we have the, the, the data back, to, back in our office, it, it's not as critical as working offshore, 12 miles offshore. Summertime is the best time to do that. It's very difficult. Price goes up in the wintertime because it's just dangerous. But what that means, here's my, here's my slide okay. <laughs> to answer your question. So the, the black dots, and I mentioned this earlier, the black dots in the little box, uh, the two little boxes with the black dots, one is the federal bar area and one is the county's bar area that have already been designed and permitted and the state of Florida, to demonstrate that your sand is eligible for placement on the beaches of the state of Florida, you need a vibracore every 1,000 feet. So that's why you see the rectangle boxes. And so the core collected these, uh, the black dots, in preparation for the federal project and were able to get their permits. They had extra cores, and so we piggybacked off them. Jason was nice enough to give those cores to the county. And we were able to design the bar site that would do the initial restoration for the non-federal project. So there's, but in the, in the federal box, that, at least on their old volume estimates, that was enough sand to meet their 50 year need. 50 year need. 50 years for the core. So what the county needs is they need more sand to either maintain this initial restoration of just a shorter area that you have in mind, or if you intend to go to the whole 18 miles, we need to know, we need to have more sand to do that. And so what Ben has laid out here are the additional cores in red that we would recommend taking right now. So we have those data in house and that completes the core collection in all areas where we believe sand is greater than three feet or four feet thick in Bora area 3A, where we know that we could potentially identify up to almost 15 million yards of sand. And that's a really good start based upon those volumes that we looked at. And that might get you for the next 15 or 20 years of sand availability for, for that portion of this Bora site. However, if we go longer term, we may have to expand into more of the green and yellow areas moving forward. But our recommendation is, is basically, and the nice thing about collecting these cores inside the area that's delineated as 3A, all the NEPA and all the other coordination with BOEM and other agencies is already complete for that area. The core finished it for the entire box. And they had intended to take all the red cores, but their coring vessel had to leave and it never came back. So th this, is, this is a task that I, th I believe is critical for particularly if we're gonna start moving forward with the planning. Otherwise, if we don't, the sooner we do it, the, we have the data, or we wait until next summer and do it again and just kind of, kind of kicks the can down the road a little bit. So, something to think about. Does that answer your question? Right, I guess uh, maybe just a quick estimate of what that would cost. I think it's right around $400,000 to collect the data. Yeah, and do, and do the analysis and give you recommendations back on what you have. Um, it, it's, it's, the mobilization is very expensive. Only there's about two companies on the east coast of the U.S. who do this 12 miles offshore who have the equipment to do it. So it's in this 65 feet of water, so it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do, or 60 feet on, to the top of the sand. So, um, yeah, so we're back uh, commissioning a parking study uh, and access inventory. 
uh, and then the easement. So that's, these, are, these are my recommendations of the immediate things that we need to be talking about to get the ball rolling. And then a lot of the other things about scope of the ultimate scope of the project, the survey of the rock and, and what that ultimately be gives us time to continue to have those conversations while these critical steps are implemented. And the sooner these get started, the better if you intend to move forward with a program and all the other pieces will tend to fall in line. And I'm available for questions once this is, you know. Again, this is Faith. Great information we received from Chris. He's the best. So, Lager County decided to move on and take the lead on this process. These are the things or the few steps I would like to recommend to proceed. I have been working with Chris and his team. We, we received proposals and cost estimate for these items. <coughs> And um, with your permission, it probably is going to be on your agenda for your approval at the upcoming meeting. He, we talked about public outreach. Every day we hear different point of view from the residents. We don't know exactly what they want us to do. There is some community lives right there on the beach and their vision, what we need to solve their problem different than anybody else within the other cities. Also, by doing that, we need to do a survey. I would like to, dis, uh, to share this with you. Since I came to Flagler County, I think it was in 2005, Flagler County and the city of Flagler Beach, they acknowledged their problems with their dunes and beaches. And at that time, they have an agreement with the Corps of Engineers to do a study. It took 15 years to complete that study. And I worked on it with a lot of commissioners, um, a lot of people. And the only reason it was delayed because of the funding. It was a match fund, 50-50% local, 50% from the Corps of Engineers, and that's why it took us that long. So all of us, we know we do have problems with our dunes and beaches for a very, very long time. The other issue we talked about, the financial analysis. Again, I have a scope and I have a cost estimate for this kind of um, activities. Uh, it has been finalized. We, we need to decide, no matter what kind of grant funding we will be applying for, we need to have some local funding. It can be TDC, it can be general funds or sale tax, but also we would like uh, to think and take a look at different option, MSTU or MSPU, or it might be a combination. I know my attorney, we have the best county attorney in the state. He can elaborate more about this. The third one here, we talked about um, the offshore sand source. So we need to do this course. And again, I do have a proposal. And the scope of work has been defined. It's ready for your approval. And um, I think that will help us tremendously, no matter what you decide, how to move, which option. It's good for us to have that location has been finalized. And if we get by FEMA, or maybe we can design a perm, uh, I'm sorry, if we get hit by any hurricane, or if Lager County, they find any local funding, we can design and permit and use that source of sand for our project. As some of the commissioners mentioned here, we can be back on the other two <coughs> projects going to be happening hopefully next spring. The last one, again, Chrissy talked about it. It's about the public access for our beaches and parking having a map and a report to identify all these locations and maybe to identify another potential locations to create more public access because that will help us if we decided to go with the Corp of Engineers, it will help us with the funding issue here. Last not least, and I, I know this is really very crit a critical issue for us for all of our projects, easements, we cannot do anything without having these easements. And again, I do have a proposal and an estimate, and all these line items are ready to come for your approval, hopefully in the upcoming board meeting. With all that said, I think this will conclude our presentation and um, we'll open it for discussion. As I mentioned, I have here Corp of Engineers, 
هي اف دي او تي ايمي فلاجر كاونتي بروجكت مانجر اند اول اوف اس هير تو انسر اني اوف يور كويشنز ثانك يو كوميشنرز اني كويشنز كوميشنر اي هاف بت وي وونت هير وذ بابليك Y'all want to do it after the public? Kind of, that's fine. Let's do that. We'll go ahead now and move to uh, public comment. We'll open it up. Uh, anyone wishing to comment, please approach the podium. State your name and uh, where you're from. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ken Bryan, uh, Chairman and Commissioner for Flagler Beach. We obviously have a, a lot of concerns. We had a special workshop last week concerning the um, what I consider to be the critical erosion within our own beach right there on Flagler Beach. So as a result of that particular meeting, we decided that we'd wait until this particular workshop in order to try to decide what we were gonna do, if anything, in order to move forward. Um, so with that being said, some of the things that I was writing down as the uh, engineer was so uh, eloquently explaining, um, the things that come to mind here is critical erosion beach, and that's something that we're experiencing right now. Uh, natural dynamic systems, um, do nothing approach, which I think we all agree when you do nothing, it could conceivably have a, uh, an impact on the infrastructure, which uh, we're very, very, much, very much concerned about. Um, some of the things that commissioner, one of the commissioners mentioned was uh, potential hardening or solutions to that effect in order to try to mitigate some of the things that we see happening. And of course, funding. And you know, we're always prepared as Commissioner Mullins and I had already talked about as far as going to the feds, going to the, <clears throat> to the state. Um, at our meeting, our, our particular workshop last week, we had our, one of our representatives, it had a, an individual there to listen to what we were gonna talk about. So I guess my concern right now and the questions that I have to take back to our constituents in Flagler Beach is how what we're talking about right now is gonna impact what we consider to be the um, natural dynamic erosions and the, what we consider to be critical. How's that gonna impact us immediately? Is there going to be a do nothing approach at this point to wait to see, because there have been some comments, the sand is out there, it's eventually gonna come back. But is it gonna come back next week or is it gonna come back in five, 10 years? And in the meantime, will we continue to experience this critical erosion, which is having a tremendous impact on our beaches? And obviously, you know, within the highway itself, we see A1A getting much closer to the what I consider to be the cliff. So what I'd like to know is, what do I take back to the folks at Flagler Beach at this point and say, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna wait, or we're gonna do nothing, or what can we do as far as some type of revetment, rocks, I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but I'm sure that they've used some modeling to determine what could be some of the immediate steps that we could take. So I'd just like to have some solutions, to, if any at all, to take back to my folks right now. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, next speaker, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Gass. I'm here representing the Hammock Dunes uh, Owners Association and our Shoreline Management Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have some prepared remarks. They might go five minutes if I could get you're, your you're indulgence. Yeah, Thank you very much. Ahead. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I want to congratulate uh, the, the county uh, and Olson and Associates for the completion of this beach management study. This is a very important milestone on the path to putting together a long-term beach management plan, which I think we all agree we need. Um, just some background on what Hammock Dunes has been doing. Uh, literally, as I stand here today, we have trucks on the northern end of our beach uh, doing a dune repair project uh, under a 15-year joint coastal permit that we uh, got with the assistance of Olson and is fully funded by Hammock Dunes. Um, so while today we're talking about uh, beach management studies and long-term plans, uh, we haven't been sitting idly by waiting for a long-term management plan to be put in place. Um, we've actually, uh, using the expertise and talents of a number of volunteers from our community, have been actively involved in shoreline management activities for the past few years since Hurricane Matthew. We recognize the need um, to do emergency dune maintenance and until a long-term solution is in place 
And in early 2021, we established our shoreline management committee and secured our joint coastal permit. Over the past six years, we've learned a lot and we've built a lot of uh, know-how and expertise in our community doing all this stuff. And um, one of the things we've learned and is that doing dune maintenance, dune maintenance alone uh, without addressing the beach situation is just not sufficient. And those comments have been made, I think, here earlier by Chris and some of the others. Uh, as demonstrated in the Olson study, our beach has lost a lot of sand and has severely eroded. And this is true of all the beaches in Flagler County. Um, and such that if we don't raise the elevation of our beach, our dunes, even the ones that we're repairing, are going to be under a continuous erosional pressure and stress just from the surf conditions. Um, and we don't want to be in a continuous cycle of doing um, small emergency repair projects on a regular basis. So given this, um, Hammock Dunes is looking at proactively uh, pursuing um, the use of hydraulically placed dredge sand on our entire the whole entire length of our beach, um, and um, that uh, and what we're looking to do is we'd like to restore our beach and our dunes to pre-Hurricane Matthew levels, and that includes going from R43.5 to Jungle Hut, um, which has some hard rock issues. Experience tells us that using truck sand placed for frequent dune maintenance and repair in the absence of beach renourishment is too expensive and it's just not sustainable for our community. Uh, our beach must be raised and widened and dredge sand is the most economical way to do that. So going forward, we're going to be seeking ways to amend our current joint coastal permit to gain access to and enable the placement of dredge seabed sand on our shoreline. We want to coordinate this effort with the county's efforts that have been discussed earlier by Faith and, and Chris. And, uh, and we want to start that immediately. And our goal would be, and we think we have to put a target out there, is to be ready to put dredge sand on our beach by 2024. And, um, and of course that will be dependent on identifying funding for the project. In saying this, we're not ignoring, um, we're not minimizing the hard bottom issues that we all recognize and have been identified by the beach management study. We expect to work with the county and engaging the applicable uh, regulatory agencies at the state and federal level, whatever is necessary, to see if mitigation of the hard bottom present at Hammock Dunes is going to have to be mitigated. Um, just returning to the beach management study for a second, Hammock Dunes endorses the 11 recommendations that are listed in the beach management study and that Chris just took you through. We think those are all necessary and appropriate next steps to be undertaken. And we've already started working on a number of these things for ourselves uh, already. We're now looking to the county to provide the necessary administrative authorities and leadership uh, that are gonna be needed to move forward in developing a long-term beach management plan. We think the county is uniquely positioned to lead, mobilize, and steward the resources, both the technical, regulatory, and the financial resources necessary to accomplish this. We also hope that Greg Hansen will continue to lead the BOCC's shoreline efforts. Uh, we think that's important. And as a shoreline property owner, we expect to be active participants with the county in drafting and establishing the appropriate ordinances. Go ahead and continue. The appropriate ordinances and conditional easements for hammock dunes to enable the county's administrative role. And it goes without saying, as sources of local funding are gonna to have to be uh, identified for the beach management plan or none of this stuff is going to be able to happen. Um, uh, hammock dunes actions to date, I think, uh, demonstrates that we're prepared to be a contributor to the local share um, as, as we move forward in whatever form that might take. In closing, again, I just wanna applaud the county and Olson's efforts in this, in this regard. Um, this undertaking is critical to the county and, and we think completing the beach management studies are, is an important milestone. We stand ready to work with the county and with our neighboring communities um, 
in support of doing this in any way we can. We want to be part of a successful long-term beach management plan for Flagler County. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Yeah, and I wanted to give that extra time because the hammock is such a big provider of uh, income and, and uh, sources for the county. Uh, next speaker, please. Good morning. My name is Laura Stillman. I live at 51 Flagler Drive. Um, in this section, I believe I'm R16, Marine Land Acres. My husband and I fell in love with this community, having never seen it. We researched online where to retire to and came down in 2019 just to see this town that we saw online. Fell in love with the beach. That is why we moved here. I wish I'd done a little more research about all the problems that we've had with the beach. Um, but I am so glad that the commission and that, that um, all of my neighbors are doing so much to try to make sure that we get to retain our beaches. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that uh, Commissioner Hansen has been very helpful with the little community that I sit, uh, uh, stay in and making sure that we have what we need. For instance, after the Nor'easter, making sure that we still still had beach access, not having to jump six feet down after we lost our beach. Um, one thing I did notice, just to point out, is the sand at that time that was trucked in. I'm glad that the um, engineers are looking at the type of sand because that sand was very fine and it blew away. So just to point that out, I was glad to see that the sand was being considered. Also about when to dredge and bring the sand in. I do understand that offshore is very dangerous in the winter time. My concern is the dredging and doing the majority of the work during the summertime. What is the impact upon the sea turtle nesting? I did not see anything in the 100 and I believe 77 pages in their, their uh, presentation. I read through it all in the past two days. I'm just concerned about the sea turtle nesting and make sure that's being considered. Um, also, a suggestion, is there any um, consideration of partnering with our um, counties on each end of our, our county, so Volusia and St. John's? Sometimes it's better to stay small, but sometimes you get more for your um, money if you partner and get a bigger group to petition for what you need. Just throwing that out there. Another is, Having visited Honeymoon Island State Park on the other coast, on the Gulf Coast, they also have done a number of beach renourishments. And I know that after one was done, I believe it was within one year, most of it had washed away. What the Corps of Engineers did, my understanding, was to put jetties in that kind of curved out from the beach. And so when the water and the sand was being washed, it kind of caught on the jetties and it helped to, to hold. I'm not an engineer, just the daughter of one, just a suggestion. And also, please communicate more. The only reason I knew about this is I happened to pay a membership fee to get with the Hammock Community <laughs> Association, and I got an email on Saturday. I had no idea this was going on. So just a, a word to the wise. Thank you for your time and for Thank your you. effort. Next speaker, please. All right. Jane Mealy, Commissioner Flagler Beach. I'd just like to um, stress what Chairman Bryan said about what we're going through right now. I know I keep saying I've watched Jason grow old with this project. The planning for the Army Corps project started in 2001, and now we're finally getting to do it. So I can see this kind of plans that you're talking about now going on for another 20 years, which doesn't help us right now. Um, and I appreciate what the people in Hammock Dunes are stressing also, but I would hope that we don't approve something or that the state or the feds don't approve something there that will have adverse effects on Flagler Beach. 
most of the currents go north-south. I know that I read that Daytona is now benefiting from our sand to the point where they can't have driving on the beach because too much of our sand is down there. Um, so I'm glad it was mentioned about the, the fine sand that was put down in the northern part of the county that then eventually did come to Flagler Beach and blew away, blew all over people's lawns and on A1A. So I hope we don't get into that kind of situation again. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Greg Johnston. I've been here since uh, 76. Um, it seems like we keep doing the same thing again and getting the same results. So just a little history, which hasn't been mentioned. The Army Corps of Engineers uh, did a great job up in Crescent Beach, early 70s. Uh, then they came in and dredged Matanzas, trying to make it a deeper inlet for boats to get out and in. And uh, instead of putting the sand onto the south side, where the sand, like she said, goes from north to south throughout Florida, uh, they decided to put it on an island, Snake Island, in the intercoastal. So all that sand should have come down to us, but yet it was put in the intercoastal. Now they're doing it again. They're dredging Matanzas again. I don't know where they're putting that sand, but they should be putting it on the beach so it comes down to us. Um, and I think this is what's caused this. We didn't have a problem before, Andy's been here a long time. We didn't have a problem back in the 70s, but now we're having the problem because of what the government did to get involved in that. So I think we need to look at the past history and, and not repeat it. I think there are, throughout the world, there's programs. We're not the only ones suffering from this. If you go over to uh, Europe, you'll find that people actually take the bulldozers down at low tide and bring the sand up to the dune and bank it. And then, uh, you know, another low tide, you bring it up. And, and I think there would be a lot of private people that live on the ocean, like I do, would be happy to pay a little bit more every year to get that sand from the low. It's our sand. We lost it down there. Just bring it back up to our dune and give us the security. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, seeing no one's uh, approaching the podium, we'll go ahead and close out and public comment. And uh, one thing I wanted to, there were a few notes that I took. Um, the a lady that was speaking about partnerships with other counties, we do have the Northeast Florida Regional Council, which is the Northeast Florida counties all come together. And we ha they have worked with us phenomenally about um, the beach erosion and the uh, uh, resiliency plan. They've been a phenomenal partner. The, the only challenge we ever find is where all counties are chasing after money and it, we're, we're, it's the first one that gets there. And um, I think you, what you guys said, having Commissioner Hansen, who's on there working, he is constantly bringing up the shoreline and the, the dunes and, and then also Commissioner Sullivan, who serves on that Northeast Florida Regional, both of them are constantly in their faces going, we need more, we need more. So. Um, we, we do, th those are something that we do already and will continue to do. Um, Commissioner Bryan, uh, our Chairman Bryan, you, you and I did certainly look at the um, beaches together and the erosion. It's um, unbelievable what I've seen there. Um, I bought here in 07 and I haven't seen that much erosion, uh, you know, in the combined years that we've seen recently, um, or it has not been brought to my attention. But um, I don't think, I think you're, I agree with you totally, and I think the commission does, to do nothing is not an answer. Um, and, and we can all kind of talk about that, but there are some serious issues out there. Federally, there's a lot of money. We, we qualify it for it. Um, and, you know, it's like owning a pool at a home. None of us really want the maintenance of it, but you love having it. And then you, all your friends want to come over and use it. But the county owns the, the, the beaches, and we've got a, make sure we take care of our, our resources. Um, the uh, hammock, uh, again, you know, one, one thing to bring up, appreciate y'all's presentation. That is such a key part of the county as far as tourism revenue and, and sources. Um, and again, all that moves south. 
So what we don't do there will, I think, will impact Flagler Beach more than what we do there. So we need to keep it, we can't fight that. So those are some great comments, so appreciate it. I don't know if staff has anything they wanna add, but I'll, if not, I'll go ahead to the commissioners. Um, and Commissioner O'Brien, do you have anything? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a just couple thoughts. Uh, just take, I'm still really trying to digest this whole thing and, and taking a lot of notes. Um, but as someone said, the problem's not going away. Mm -mm. And, and obviously we, we, we need to figure out how we're gonna take action going forward amongst the options that we have. Um, I, I think the biggest priority needs to be preservation of life and property uh, in no matter what we do. So we have to prioritize, prioritize that way amongst those 18 miles, I think. And um, probably the biggest thing that, that stuck with me was uh, we need to identify a, a dedicated funding source. So if we are gonna undertake this, we, we can properly plan and have the funds to be able to do that long-term and not, not band-aid it or take a piecemeal approach. So I look forward to us continuing to discuss those ways. And I think, as I heard from Faith, that's, that's one of the next steps from the staff in terms of providing options for us to, to look at. So that's all I had at this point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, just a couple of things. I, I can't help, I like anecdotes. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of the jetties going out, the ultimate example of that is uh, in this state is the St. John's River, uh, where the Navy uh, base is there at Mayport and the ships that have to go in and out with 50-foot dredge, you know, deep uh, channels. So they put in these very, very, very long jetties that stick out into the ocean from the St. John's River. On the north side of that jetty, there is so much sand that has been built up when they did the movie G.I. Jane, they used it for desert scenes. And I can prove that because if you ever watch that movie, you can see the USS John F. Kennedy in the background as they were filming. The point is, jetties do have a, 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 a reason. What that does is Fernandina, Be Fernandina Beach gets lots of sand from the Navy and they keep their beach in great shape. So that's just jetties. The other one is, I've been around a long time too, and I know a lot of places along the coast, one of the gentlemen who spoke here at the end, the idea when you have the situation we have at the pier right now, where we have a lot of the sand that's just moved 100 feet or so uh, seaward and, and become part of the sand dunes there that, that uncover at low tide and cover back up. At, I mean, you, you can put a tractor in there at low tide and for very short-term fixes, start plowing that sand back up uh, on the beach. Now, I don't know what the rules are that at all. I know that it's done all along the coast, and it's been done for years and years and years. But funding is, 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 uh, is, is a key issue here. I think we have to go with a long-term study. It's not so long-term as far as the Army Corps program and the additional FDOT County program that does take care of the, the six miles, of the 18 miles, the six miles uh, to the south, including the peer area, are included in kind of funded, depending on inflation, funded um, uh, pieces that can get done with the dredge. So that's kind of my, my feeling is that, that we have a plan. That's the uh, semi near-term plan. It's not tomorrow. And, uh, but but I, I think that's the plan that we have for the six miles at the south end of the county, whether we go option one, two, three, or four, five, six, it doesn't matter. We're going forward with the Army Corps program and the um, and the, what I call the county FDOT program. That's what I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do to uh, reduce the cost of this program. And uh, one of those is to actively engage with the Corps of Engineers, which we will do. Um, <clears throat> but, but I think we have to convince the state, and I know... Chris is, doesn't think I'm going to get any headway there, but we need to we need to really get in deep discussion with the state on these rocks and uh, the ability to use hardening uh, where we think it's appropriate. So I really feel that we'll put forth a program that <clears throat> that addresses those things in writing to the to the DEP and say, okay, what's what's your answer? What's your decision on this? Um, and, uh, and we will work with the Corps to, once again, do another survey for the Northern 12, and I think we'll have a better answer for you, a better 
picture for you to look at. So uh, I think we're doing all the right things. Uh, we are. We've already made the decision to take over management of the beach, and and I understand Al's working on the that ordinance already. So uh, I think we're headed the right direction with uh, face leadership. Um, we'll we'll get some things done, but those, the rocks and the hardening are two issues. I think we have to we have to get some help. I think from the state on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hanson. Uh, Commissioner Dams. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions. I don't know who's the the historian on the hard bottom areas. Um, I had heard that that there was this in the past that those had been covered. Do we have historical references to how much of that area had been covered with sand in the past, and where was it? Is is it recent exposure that has uncovered most of that? Yeah, <clears throat> mostly there's a lot of anecdotal information. Even if you go in the literature, there's not a lot of there are references to rock being in this northern part of Flagler County. Uh, the extent of it, there's a report from 99 DEP wrote that suggested it went down to about Varn Park, but it's not very specific. It's very, and so, but I think there is, it, it's become more prominent since the recent storm events. Erosion has exposed more of it. And so, but there's just not a lot of historical information about the scope and scale of this stuff. And it really lean, leads back to our recommendation of a more, more specific investigation of what's actually there and what it is. Nobody really knows, and even the agencies don't, aren't aware of it yet. Chris, we've, uh, we have exhausted a search <clears throat> of the literature and with FDEP. What, what do you have? And they don't have anything, which means we really need to do the study. But to answer Andy's question, yes, we've got the pictures and everything of those rocks completely covered by sand, completely covered. And Matthew uncovered them. Yeah, and aerial that, photography is going yeah. to be your historical aerial photography yeah, got is the best thing you have. Yeah, it's the best thing at this point. But we don't have an official study of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Has it has the have the hard bottom areas shown to be a, a better prevention for doing erosion, or does it not make any difference for the? You know, it, it can the, definitely have an, a beneficial effect, and that was the point of the 99 DEP study. It was a shoreline change study, and they were making references to shoreline behavior behind these rock areas, uh, trying to it, very limited data, but they were trying to make references to behavior differences between behind the rock versus other parts of the county. So it definitely can have a stabilizing effect to it, but it can have a scouring effect as well. I know we can um, we can learn a lot about what's what's happened in other parts. You made a few references. Is there a, um, a specific area in the state that is, that is more aligned to the issues we're facing with infrastructure right along A1A for a long stretch of the coast? And I know everybody is built upon the coast, but we have critical infrastructure right, right. along the coast. You know, there's a couple, there are only a couple of areas that A1A is so close to the to the beach. One is in Fort Lauderdale, uh, where I've worked on that project. Um, you, typically, there is infrastructure between the beach and the road in a lots of the areas, the houses. Yeah. See, and, um, so that is a pretty unique situation in Flagler County, which makes it unique and makes the view and everything. Uh, but there are other uh, examples that you can you can go to. A lot of these East Coast communities face the very similar situations as Flagler, including St. John's County, um, with different versions of that. So there's, there are definitely, any of the East Coast counties are facing very similar type situations. I, I do think, I'm, I think, along with everybody else, that a, a, a financial plan is, is in order to be able to look at, you know, having sustainable um, income to, if we're going to do these, the long-term plan. Um, I think I'm I'm in the same boat. I know the rest of the commission has been on this longer than me, um, so I'm still learning a lot of uh, what's been going on in the past to get to where we are. Um, so you know, still look okay. to the conversations that we've got coming up. But um, appreciate the plan. And, you know, I'm glad that we're getting into a a long-term plan to properly manage and evaluate the beaches and not be reactive, but um, get something in place. So thank you. Uh, Chris, one thing I forgot to bring up um, that I think I will with FDEP, but wave attenuation issues, things that we can do to slow down or 
knock down the wave action as they come in. They're experimenting with that in South Florida right now. Um, and, but I think that's something else that we could, we could consider off our beaches to try to cut down the wave action. So anyway, that's something else we're going to look at. Also. Yeah, I mean, lots of these things are, there's lots of history with those types of things in, in, in Florida. Uh, DEP has pretty specific rules about, about what you do, uh, and we have experience with those as well. I, I was, uh, I w wanted to step back to, I, I, uh, when I, before I kind of jump right into my presentation, I appreciate the opportunity to do this for Flagler County. It's, it's been a very interesting investigation for our firm. Uh, we feel like we bring a lot of expertise and experience to it, uh, but it's been a great learning experience for us as well. Uh, and uh, we're always available for questions uh, should there be any, as, as these dis discussions continue to, to help you guys uh, navigate this process. If we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll try to find somebody who does. So, Thank you. Commissioners, do you have um, more time to discuss this issue with the Corp of Engineers, especially about uh, another study? So I would like to ask Jason to come and elaborate more about the approach, how long it will take, the cost, and what kind is going to be having on our schedule to move forward. Good morning, Commissioner Jason Hara. I'm the Senior Project Manager for the Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville. Uh, the Cliff Note version of a core study, uh, you heard Faith talk about a 15-year study in the past. Um, approximately six years ago, General Seminite up in our headquarters basically put a proposal together that studies now for the Corps will not take 15 years. We will not have the federal lapse in appropriations like we had that caused that. All core studies now under the smart planning process are three years, three million dollars. Um, to exceed three years requires congressional approval, so we cannot go past three years. All core studies start with a letter from a non-federal sponsor stating that you have an issue, you would like the core to look at the issue with specific parameters as far as location, what you're interested in, etc. That is the step one. The next two steps that are required is we have to have a study authority and we have to have a federal appropriation. So it takes authority and appropriations to make those happen. Um, I will tell you that St. John's County had a similar instance here where we did a study back in 2014 for them that included Summer Haven, um, Volano Beach, all the way up through Ponte Vedra. There was areas of that study that were excluded. They got about a three mile project that was authorized in Volano Beach, very similar situation to Flagler. What their county commission voted to do was to do another study with the Corps since we've had Hurricane Matthew and other storms um, that those areas may now qualify based on the damages. So they entered into a new agreement with us. We are currently about a year into that study and it looks like they potentially could get another five to seven miles authorized just because of the damages from Matthew and Irma, et cetera. So that's the approach St. John's took. Um, there's other counties that work directly independently with a consultant. Both ways work just fine. But in the event that you would elect to tell us, we want you to look at expanding the Flagler, City of Flagler Beach study from here all the way to St. John's County. That starts with a letter from the chairman of the commission saying we want to enter into this and then we start the authority and the appropriations. I, I want to say this real quick. Commissioner Sullivan and Commissioner Dance had to leave for canvassing board, so that's why they departed. They, they very concerned about this issue. Um, the uh, Commissioner Hanson, any questions or anything? No, and we've talked to Jason and, and Faith, and, I, and I'm pretty sure we're going to do that, yeah. uh, at least the, this initiate the first part of the study. But as soon as we get our act together about what we want you to look at, but and I think that's coming. We're going to yes. do that pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Trance, one thing very important to that study I just want to mention for 30 seconds. One is the core first, for the first six months to a year, we analyze the beach with models. And we'll be able to tell you within the first 12 months, these look like the areas that have federal interest. Right. We know the area where the seawall is won't qualify. We're going to put it in a model. It's going to get damaged. But our big damages come from erosion to A1A. That's how we spike the benefits, sure. right? Mm. So, but there will be potentially an area that gets, um, we say, has federal interest. Now the next step is cost share. The cost share is all related to how much parking and access you have every half mile in that area. Having that study, the parking access inventory, exactly you know, accelerates that discussion uh, very much. So. 
But we do stand the core. We're ready to enter into uh, the discussions with you if you would elect to move forward with a study from the, our 2.6 mile project up to St. John's County line. But it all starts with a letter. Then we have to get into the authorities and the appropriations. Okay. I think the letter needs to go out. Uh, yeah. Commissioner O'Brien, anything? Um, one thing I want to say too, um, the, the, something to keep in mind for everybody in the county, there's not one commissioner up here that doesn't deal with a drainage issue or a, um, a w issue with water here in this county. And this all kind of runs together. The, the way we see water at all kind of the water table, it all flows together. So these beaches are important to the west side uh, drainage and, and water as they are to the east side. So everybody in the county, this is a problem, even in Palm Coast, the, the swells, they drain towards this. So the more saturation we have, the harder it's gonna be to drain the canals, the, the other things. So these are important issues. Um, and I think every commissioner up here deals with one way or another. Um, so this is a great presentation. It's great getting it out in the dialogue that we need to do this on an ongoing basis, not just a one time and, and, and deal with it. Um, these beaches are here to stay. Um, again, we own the pool. We got to maintain the pool. So um, I, I think it was great. Without that being said, I'll go ahead and um, take a motion for adjournment. Move we adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you all for coming today.